Good afternoon friends. Welcome to the STP training webinar, Testing Your Minimum Viable Product, MVP. Our speaker for the day is Tathagat Verma. I'm Smita Mishra, a professional tester myself, and I'm excited to host you all and Tathagat on our STP trainings. Tathagat, I wanted to take advantage of the fact that we all, we all are here and share quick information with all the testers who have joined us. We have our conference Fall 2017 STP Con coming up in the Washington DC area from September 25th through 29th this year. As you can see on the screen, we have various certification courses through these dates. There are workshops through September 26, 27 and conference and sessions through September 28, 29th. The conference topics shall include automation, agile, performance, DevOps, mobile, security, leadership, strategy, and much more. And we typically have quite a few keynotes, workshops, and over 40 sessions spanning across various formats like case studies, hands-on exercises, and tool demos. The complete program will be up there shortly. However, the workshops are already published, and you can explore the same at stpcon.com. If you register by 26th of August, you get to save up to $400 off your registration. As a tester myself, I have found conferring to be one of the best ways to learn and also to get to know reputed testers across the globe. So I hope you all find it to be the same way. And if you are on Twitter, please share the conference information and about this webinar with your followers and connections. We love the shout outs and if you hear something you like during the webinar, please tweet about it. You can use at Software Test Pro for a retweet from us. Another quick piece of information that I wanted to share with you is there is an upcoming webinar, Getting Started with Automation, by Curtis Stuerenberg on 14th June. The link is up for you to review and register. Curtis has been a renowned speaker at STP. He's an authority on test automation and a specialist on testing in general. He loves sharing his practical insights, something you all will enjoy. So I hope you go for it. All right, so let's get started with our webinar for today. A very warm welcome, Tathagat. We are very thrilled to have you with us today. And let me quickly introduce you for all of us here. Tathagat Verma, who is also known as TV, is a software professional by education, a computer scientist by accident, HR student by interest, a project management pr practitioner by training, he's curious by nature, a learner by habit, a teacher by passion, a wanderer by choice, and a digital influencer by night, a servant leader by conviction, and also a first-time author. So in short, someone who has never managed to become an expert because he was always busy learning new things. Tathagat has a legacy of being involved with high-tech software product development, and business operations since 1991 with multiple leading organizations of the world, including Yahoo, where he has led center-wide adoption of agile, business excellence, and IP programs. Right before I get started with uh, uh, the webinar, few housekeeping points. All the attendees shall remain muted through the webinar. You can type in your questions and share them with us through your question or chat box whichever appears on your version of GoToWebinar. We shall take them up after Tathagat is done with his presentation. So the webinar shall be recorded and posted on Software Test Pro site for the attendees to go through later. Do not worry about that and just focus on learning and asking questions. All right, Tathagat, very warm welcome again and the floor is all yours. Uh, thank you, Smitha, and thanks for the generous introduction. Uh, I hope my uh, slide deck is visible to, to everyone. Yes. Okay. So, uh, morning, friends. Um, morning or good evening, depending on which part of the world you are in. Thank you for dialing in. Uh, I'm based out of Bangalore, and uh, right now it's, it's been pouring here and a lot of thunderstorms. So, if you, if you occasionally hear some thunderstorms in the background, uh, it's, uh, it's not my neighbors fighting with me. It's actually the thunderstorm that's uh, probably keeping us busy. So with that, I want to kind of uh, have a conversation with all of you today on uh, how do we test uh, the MVP. Uh, 
in, in the world of uh, innovation uh, today, everyone is suddenly talking about building their own startup or even if you work for a large company, chances are very likely that you are uh, undertaking some endeavor which has never been done in the past in your, in your company or by you. And uh, uh, the question then invariably comes is, well, how do you really go about building something like that? Uh, you have heard of a lot of horror stories of uh, the new startups failing and so on and so forth. Uh, enough to make you uh, kind of uh, get some uh, cold feet there. Uh, but I think there is a method to the madness. There are ways in which people uh, smarter than us have figured out how to really make it happen. I keep following them. I keep learning from people who are smarter than me. And in this uh, webinar today, I want to talk about some of the ways of how we can test our MVP. Uh, if you don't know MVP at this point in time, that's okay because I'll have a light introduction to what is MVP here. So let's, let's, uh, let's get kicking here. Uh, now, uh, I'm sure you've heard of a lot of uh, stories of the proverbial uh, way of building uh, startups like you, like you say, hey, don't worry about building something, build and they will come, right? I mean, that's the way we typically say that. Um, uh, and, and if you really sample some of these stories that I'm sharing on this slide here, uh, well, it has never been the case actually. I mean, uh, uh, Apple is a great company, wonderful products there. But if you look at Apple, Newton um, invested uh, $100 million but did not really get to uh, a, a commercial success out of the product. Webvan was a classic case during the dot-com time which uh, saw investments above a billion dollars and uh, they were probably too ahead of their time and they were not able to really sell the whole idea there. Uh, the Microsoft Zoom uh, players uh, uh, were not really something that uh, that they were uh, that that were able to kind of hold the market for some time. Uh, even Amazon, a great company, wonderful products, uh, uh, awesome in innovation uh, DNA in the mindset. Uh, they came up with Amazon Fire smartphone, uh, kind of a phone which was like too advanced at that point in time. But they ended up with literally within a couple of months uh, writing off 170 million dollars when they uh, instead of the 200 dollar phone they started offering it at 99 cents um, so and and then target canada is a great example of uh, of how target went to canada uh, wanting to open uh, a lot of stores in canada and what could have been uh, I mean, it could not have been any more easier than just crossing over the border and, and going a little more north and starting up all the stores. Uh, but they came back within two years with over $7 billion written off, 17,000 job losses and so on. So there are many such stories uh, which actually make us question, uh, build and they will come uh, really. And, and, and the key thing is, why did they really fail there? Uh, is it because they had a fundamentally bad idea or they had a bad team or lack of funding uh, or maybe the technology was not so good and so on? Uh, people might attribute a lot of uh, things. Uh, I look up to my guru for guidance, uh, Steve Blank, and he has a wonderful uh, point of view on that. And he says, build and they will come uh, is not a strategy, it's a prayer. And uh, it doesn't quite work in uh, in any of the contexts there. And, and Someone like Steve Blank knows it better than a lot of us because he has been an entrepreneur for probably what 30, 40 years, uh, and he 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 teaches, uh, he he grooms uh, entrepreneurs. So uh, the, the the sad reality uh, still, despite that, is 90% of the startups fail. Uh, at least the technology startups that we are interested in, and uh, this is this seems to be kind of a global statistics uh, throughout the ages. Now 90% is uh, metaphorical, 90% here, uh, and and by and large we see the same kind of numbers uh, there. Why do they fail? There can, there can be n number of reasons here, but predominantly we see that uh, uh, building something that nobody wants or there's no market for a product uh, take, uh, takes uh, the honors here. Uh, so we are building something and uh, we, we believe that there's a market uh, ready for it, which is just, just waiting for you to come up with a launch announcement and they will start doing it. Uh, and people just go out and scale up the companies based on that uh, naive assumption. Uh, doesn't quite work that way. So, that's that's the biggest bane of uh, uh, startups. That's that's the biggest uh, nemesis of the startup movement. How do we really uh, uh, take care of something like that? Because in today's time and age, it's not worth anybody's uh, talent or time to build something. I think it's the biggest shame to build something that nobody wants. So how can we avoid the trap of uh, building something like? That? Now, uh, before we get jump into the details, let's briefly look at what is the startup's context. What is it really uh, trying to do, uh, and what kind of environment or context it exists in. Uh, I, I believe a startup is really a bold experiment to the question, should this business be built? 
uh, a lot of times people uh, again there's a naive assumption uh, that hey I have some technical stuff and I can build up a website or I can build some cool uh, hack here a technology hack uh, and I think let's go out and find some uh, uh, market for that uh, I, I call this as a solution in search of a problem syndrome there I, I see a lot of times the techie startup guys I, well I am a techie so it's kind of uh, I, I'm not saying that techies are bad there but the point is we get so we fall so much in love with the technology that we see everything as a business so uh, when we, do, we we come up with a good technology hack there we sometimes build the whole solution and then we are not sure where is the market so we are searching for the problem there uh, but we we don't understand that a technology hack may or may not translate into a viable business uh, so a startup is really much beyond and bigger than that where because it's trying to really answer the question should this business be even built rather than saying is this technology uh, product really uh, feasible or not the startups when they are starting out by nature uh, are kind of dealing with the unknown unknown, unknown domain uh, they don't know uh, the problem domain they don't always know the solution domain and they are really trying to find out um, in between uh, all this what is the business model how can they repeatably and scalably make money out of it because end of the day well I'm not saying money in a negative sense but I'm saying money in the positive sense because any startup has to eventually have a sustainable business model uh, if it is going to only depend on the uh, the investor funding it will implode at some point in time and we have enough examples of that so so it has to really find a way to build uh, items that could be products or services of value deliver it to the customers at a price point and make a sustainable uh, business out of that uh, and uh, to do that they invariably go wrong as we see 90 percent of the time they go wrong they fail actually uh, so what really helps the most successful startups is early and frequent feedbacks and these feedbacks are really helping them to uh, do mid-course corrections and uh, keep realigning them um, the, so, so, so that at any point in time if you actually look at it they will be off, uh, off the course but eventually when you look at the whole journey and if you were to map it you will find that they've been constantly realigning themselves to the vision of the company they keep probably changing the strategy depending on how things uh, uh, pan out but they are really uh, sticking to the vision uh, of what they want to accomplish here so that's that's kind of the startups context here now if we look at a startup it, it does look like a lot of chaotic things happening there and then suddenly magically you have a, a company that becomes successful uh, and, and it grows up and goes for an IPO uh, but are there any is, is there any method to the madness is there any systematic way that we can really look at a startup here uh, this is a model that I like uh, uh, quite a lot uh, it's really the three stages of a startup so in the stage one you're really trying to find uh, what we call is a problem solution fit where the fundamental question that is being addressed is do I have a problem worth solving uh, if, if, if it might be of interest to me because I find that as a very let's say interesting or a compelling idea but if it is not something that the market is looking for then it might only be my problem and market may not be uh, interested in my uh, my further discussion on that so that's the first thing that we want to really understand the second thing sorry that we want to understand is the stage two which is the product market fit uh, and the product market fit is really all about well have I built something that people want so uh, they might have a problem fair enough but uh, is my solution acceptable to them or there might be n number of other solutions available to them uh, I don't want to certainly go out and do a full-blown uh, development of that uh, solution without really getting some kind of a feedback but when I do get the feedback there I go on to the stage three which is the scaling up part uh, where uh, basically I'm saying well hey how can I now accelerate the growth so so, uh, so, so that's the kind of a uh, thing which is really going to uh, uh, th these are the three discussion points that we invariably look at and as we saw one of the biggest reasons of startup failure is a premature scaling which means uh, I, have, I haven't really quite figured out my problem solution fit or I haven't quite figured out my product market fit but I just go in and, and I just because I've been lucky uh, I, I get some funding there I just go out hire my VP of sales I hire my VP of marketing I hire uh, 20 engineers and then build the whole thing and go for a full-blown uh, uh, kind of a launch there and the whole development is happening in a stealth mode kind of a thing now a lot of this this stuff really happened uh, uh, during the dot-com time because that was the predominant way of uh, 
kind of uh, bootstrapping and building something there and people used to say that I'm working in a stealth mode startup and so on. Uh, guess what? None of these things have really been proven to be uh, a recipe for success uh, because people actually say that, uh, well, it doesn't quite work that you really go underground for six months or 12 months and then build something and come out back to the civilization and say, okay, here is the next shiny uh, product that uh, uh, you all want, you, know, you are all waiting for. People uh, need to understand that they will they don't have all the answers, so they need to calibrate their uh, hypothesis uh, with the market, with the customers, with the potential users of their products there, understand what technology they use and uh, they choose and what will be the implications of that. So what we need to understand is how can we apply a systematic logic to, to basically go from stage one to stage two. And that is the predominant uh, discussion for today. Uh, because once you have gone to the stage two uh, there, you have understood what product is going to meet the market uh, requirements and then scaling up could be a matter of uh, well getting the right kind of a funding or building a scaling playbook which allows you to kind of uh, go through the whole scaling up process but if you don't really have the right product to begin with it might be too premature to kind of scale up the whole thing so in today's discussion we really want to understand how do I enter the stage one and how do I have my journey going on till the stage two now, in a, in, in a startup, what's happening in this journey? I guess we just lost you, Tathagat. It goes to a, a regular company there. The only thing it can actually show is learning as, as a milestone, uh, and that's what the startup really does there. Uh, because let's not forget, the startup's most scarce resource is time. I mean, money can come back, people can, you can always get potentially uh, the best talent in town, but time is something that is the, the biggest challenge there. Uh, one of the things that when I talk to the startups, I, I tell them is that you should always assume there are at least a dozen companies, if not more, uh, globally that are working on exactly the same idea as yours. And uh, if you are not really uh, quick in, in really being able to learn about the, uh, the market and the customers and the product that you intend to build, uh, you might realize that uh, you, you probably lose the race there in the long run. So I think time is the most important resource that we want to conserve. And like Eric Ries says in his uh, blue book on the Lean Startup, he says uh, the most successful companies will not be the one which are fastest, but they will the, the most successful companies will be the one which learn the fastest. I think that's really the key part of it. So time is of essence there because we want to keep learning in the quickest possible time and keep adapting to those uh, uh, things there. Well, the traditional approach that people have taken, companies have taken, is building a 100% product. So they, they start building a 100% product because they say, okay, it's a new problem, let's start solving this problem. But uh, what we have seen from enough number of uh, failed experiments, that 100% product is too, first of all, it's too time consuming. You might probably spend three or four quarters in just building the entire product out. Uh, it obviously because of the time and the runway that it is it needs it will end up becoming costly because you are funding the entire thing without even uh, getting any revenues or anything like that uh, it is too risky it's fraught with a lot of risks there because uh, you have no way of knowing whether what you have designed is really the right solution that people are looking for or not uh, and it might even be very boring because let's be honest uh, everybody especially in our industry we are looking for a lot of feedback, we are looking for a lot of validation whether what we have designed uh, and, and I think nothing gives more pride to, to a developer and I'm using developer in a very broad sense. I'm not really saying from a function but I'm saying anybody in, to me who is involved in creating a product is a developer. I might be a database engineer or a QA engineer or a uh, test engineer or, 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 or a um, uh, designer but in my view everybody is a developer because they are all contributing to development of the product there. So I think it's a very boring thing for any developer to build something and not to get any feedback whether people like it or not, whether people use it or not. So I think uh, sustaining that level of uh, uh, motivation for a long period of time would be very difficult there. So the question that comes is a what is alt alternative here? Do, can we instead of building anything 100% what can we do there? So let's that's where the whole MVP discussion comes there. So let's uh, talk about the MVP here. Uh, the concept of minimum viable product or MVP was coined uh, back in 2001 by Frank Robinson. Uh, and he basically said that it's a unique product that maximizes return on risk for both the vendor and the customer there. Now, he uh, obviously these were the, the, that was a time before even the, the whole startup movement kind of started becoming what it is today. Uh, he gave a fairly generic, uh, uh, kind of a definition and if you look at the graph here uh, he basically gives a very nice perspective a positioning of the minimum viable product as something which is um, 
which is not just from the point of view of the vendor alone but also for the customer because uh, uh, and, and he talks about the whole hurdle rate so he brings the whole economic perspective uh, obviously an MVP has to uh, be better than the ROI has to be better than the hurdle rate uh, as we know the hurdle rate is something which is the like the bare minimum thing that any business must meet in order to be funded uh, so if a company might have a hurdle rate which is like 12% return on my uh, uh, investments then I should be able to theoretically give better than 12% ROI on that so an MVP is something which is giving the higher ROI but it is not proportionately spending the same amount of effort on accomplishing it it is in fact it's actually uh, uh, spending far less amount of effort in delivering it so the idea is uh, uh, give minimum amount of effort but uh, but uh, get maximum amount of outcomes out of the whole equation so that your ROI is the highest there. Uh, he also goes on to describe that MVP is really a mindset uh, and uh, the, the, the whole idea is that while you are thinking big uh, you also want to start thinking small so take baby steps so that you can eventually take the giant leap kind of a thinking. So let's uh, uh, continue to develop the subject further and then talk about how does the MVP really apply uh, to there. So uh, Eric Ries has given the whole uh, founding definition of it in the context of startups and in his book he says an MVP is something that actually helps uh, entrepreneurs start the process of learning as quickly as possible. Uh, a lot of times people actually say oh I built the MVP and that is the end of my it's actually a demonstration or a validation of what I already know but actually nothing could be further from the truth because an MVP is something which is the starting point and not the end point of the learning journey. And it is not necessarily the smallest product imaginable. Uh, it is simply the fastest way to get through what he calls as the build, measure, and learn loop uh, or the feedback loop with minimum effort, uh, upfront effort on that. So the idea is that we want to learn as much as possible about a given hypothesis, uh, but by by spending really the minimum amount of effort on that, and then whatever we build it, we are subjecting it through what we call as the build measure and learn which is basically as, as as quality professionals we know it's basically yet another nice name for the PDCA loop so the Deming's loop uh, uh, plan do check and act for example so we are, we are, we are basically it's a closed loop management that we are looking at but only thing we are saying is instead of running it like a multi-year or a multi-month kind of a loop we really want to have a very short loop sometimes it could be weeks or, or days or hours uh, basically to learn something about a hypothesis. And finally, unlike a prototype or a concept test, an MVP is designed not just to answer the product design or technical uh, question, but to test the fundamental business hypothesis. I think it's a very important distinction here. We are not limiting ourselves to just the attributes of the product alone, uh, but in our view, the product itself is basically the entire business and not just the piece of code that we have written here. So we might be looking at uh, the revenue streams or the channels or the or, or the cost of building something, the whole nine yards of that uh, um, and, and doing it. And pictorially, there are a lot of representations that you might find. I like uh, the one by Hendrik Nyberg as one of the best ones here, uh, where, for example, if all you are big building is a car, uh, a lot of times people think that my MVP is really going to be, uh, well, I take a wheel and then I connect two wheels with an Excel and then I put a body on that and kind of build the car. Uh, but that's not really the best way of looking at an MVP because, uh, well, you're not really getting any validation on the problem or the fundamental hypothesis that you are trying to solve here. Uh, so, uh, because you are saying a car is something which, uh, which uh, take people there. Uh, now, I, I reframe the problem and I say, well, what's a car? I'm actually designing a mobile platform which allows people to go from point A to point B. So I reframed the problem in such a manner that now I'm saying, okay, what kind of, hypo, what kind of hy uh, hypothesis do I need to make or what kind of assumptions do I have about a mobile platform which can go from a point A to point B and ferry people uh, uh, accordingly? Now, one of the things might be that I need to know whether it's a flat uh, surface which is motorable. So I might really start uh, looking at a problem with, let's say, using a skateboard. Now, a skateboard may not be the best idea, but at least I can know whether it's a rocky gravel that I'm working on or it's a sandy area or is it something like a smooth, flat surface because it has to be something that is motorable there. Uh, and then I can go on to the kids uh, push scooter and then I go on to the bicycle and a motorbike and eventually a car. So I'm reframing my problem in order to learn as much as I can about my fundamental uh, my riskiest hypothesis about the problem. So an MVP is more like the, the picture two rather than the picture one that uh, we are looking at here. 
Now, MVP it has a lot of myths around it. A lot of times people think that MVP, for example, people think technology is MVP. Uh, well, technology could be one of the components of the MVP, but MVP, like I said, is a, there's a whole nine yards of business here. Uh, a lot of techies invariably think that code is the MVP. So if I write a smart piece of code or I build some kind of a, uh, a prototype or I show some kind of a website, a nice nifty app here on the mobile phone, then that's an MVP. But that's not really an MVP here. Uh, a prototype, again, could be solving or demonstrating certain cool technical assumptions about something. Like, for example, I'm, I want to try um, uh, uh, some kind of a new design paradigm that Google has come up with, and I want to see whether how, how people respond to that. Now, that might be a specific prototype to test out and see uh, how a design uh, paradigm really works uh, or what's the performance of that, but that may or may not fully qualify to be an MVP. Uh, a lot of traditional companies that are used to working in a B2B environment where we have the alphas and the beta versions, we sometimes think that the beta version is an MVP. Well, a beta version is actually pretty close to the finished product and it almost already has 100% of the effort uh, that was originally designed to be. So you have all the features and everything and what have you. And that's not really an MVP because you are already going with a, with a very clear perspective of, hey, this is what we are really we, with this what we have really designed for you guys tell me whether it works or not whereas an MVP is really like we are not we, we are not going with the arrogance of saying that we know everything but we are saying that we are going with the humility that hey we find the problem interesting enough and we would like to solve it can you guys really help us in in aligning and really understanding what is the right problem uh, that is worth solving there as you can see if that is a conversation you want to have, a beta version may not be the right uh, conversation starter for that because uh, the people might say, hey, it seems like you've already made up your mind about what the product and the solution should look like. Why are you even here in the first place? Uh, because you, you're just seeking some kind of a confirmation uh, bias from me. So. Sometimes people think that, uh, well, I can just give a very, uh, very crappy product there, something that probably has a very, uh, it has falling parts all the time, it has bad quality, uh, it hangs and crashes a lot of times. Well, uh, it's a little subjective here. If you read uh, Eric Ries' book, he will actually go on to say that it's okay to actually give that kind of a uh, software as an MVP. But uh, he, here's the thing, uh, if, if I want to basically show it to some uh, early adopters or some, some potential customers, and if that software is falling apart half the time there, I don't think it's going to make a very uh, favorable impression in their minds about uh, my capability to understand the problem and come up with a solution there. So the best MVPs are something that only, only cut down on the scope, but they don't really cut down on the fun uh, non-functional aspects of that. So instead of delivering 100% of the features and 0% of the NFRs or the non-functional requirements, what we want to really do is take this, that thinnest sliver of functionality, maybe 2%, maybe 5%, maybe 7% of that functionality or 10% of that functionality, but don't really compromise on the non-functional requirements of that. that. Those NFRs should really be there. So a product should look exactly how it should look like uh, when it is finally delivered as much as possible. The scope can really be. Now, that's a question. So how do you design the scope of that? And those are, I think, the biggest questions there in terms of designing that MVP. So we'll discuss that in the coming slides here. Another uh, big bit that I've seen with the MVPs is that uh, a lot of, and, and this is especially with some of the large enterprises that I work with, uh, is like, hey, MVP means I can get faster to the market. So instead of, well, my, my product is going to take nine months, I cannot wait it, why don't we release an MVP in three months? And it's like, that's not the way you want to look at it. Uh, even you don't want to look at it as a revenue acceleration mechanism. If anything, to me, a, an MVP is actually a feedback acceleration mechanism. It, it is simply creating uh, some kind of a physical, tangible object that allows you to expedite the feedback from your uh, intended end users, rather than really seeing that as a source of revenue. Uh, so, so that's uh, the perspective here. Also, a lot of times people think that one MVP and I'm done, uh, but I think uh, that's not really the right thing. You have to probably keep looking at MVP as, as, as the learning points and, and uh, till, till the time you get to the product market fit, you probably have to keep experimenting. In some cases, it might even be beyond it, but at the minimum, until you get to the stage two, which is the product market fit, you might need five or 10 or 20 MVPs. We don't know at this point in time, right? And then and different uh, domains could have a different way of looking at it. So this might be uh, needed here. So finally, just to conclude on that MVP discussion and, and then move on to some of the ways of testing it, uh, MVP to me is really, to first and foremost, it's a mindset. 
that hey we don't have all the solutions here but with some kind of an experimentation we can we, we know that the market has the answers and uh, if we are able to design certain experiments here then we can find out from the market some of these answers there and if we if we are humble enough to really seek the answers as opposed to selling the solutions there then i think the market will respond favorably and allow us to to build it and and then it's a process of identifying the riskiest assumptions designing the smallest and the cheapest experiments uh, to basically acquire what we call as the validated learning uh, and then correct the course as often as required there so to me these this is the way i would look at it a lot of times people uh, uh, stop at the discussion and say oh MVP is that smallest slice of the product there I think there is something beyond the product there is a mindset in the process and I wanted to kind of uh, call it out here so why test the MVP uh, well I think that's a very interesting part because as a test engineers and especially I'm sure uh, people on this uh, webinar would be uh, functionally expert and uh, a lot of times we are testing because we are validating what we already know but in, in, in the case of testing the MVP, we are really trying to learn what we don't really know. Uh, and that is the notion of the testing when we say, how do we test our MVP here? And th there's no such thing as the expected output, to be honest there, because we are really, uh, I won't say that it's actually an ad hoc way of shooting in the dark. We are doing certain uh, uh, experiments and we are putting certain, uh, certain kind of a rigor in that. But the key thing is that we are seeking learning, not validation. And that's the... Uh, uh, context and finally whatever you get is the right output because well uh, that's the right output now whether it is something that you can work with is, is something that you will have to decide there so uh, it's not to say that any output uh, has to be right or wrong that this case has passed or passed or failed in the traditional sense what you get is what the market is telling you now have you done the right sampling here have you gone to the right people there that's a question you will have to rigorously uh, ask yourself and, and convince yourself only then you can kind of go to that so so let's see so how so show me how we can really do that so so here is what we will do we will uh, our interest is to really get to the product market fit uh, that is really finding the right kind of a product that's that's going to meet the requirements of the product uh, of uh, the product that meets the requirements of the market I'm sorry and what kind of MVPs will help and how do we test them so the first step is is there a problem worth solving I think that's the first uh, important thing even we, before we start coding something or building something we want to really know is there a problem worth solving now there are many ways of really validating whether that problem has enough attention or enough interest in the market I'm talk, going to walk you through some of them so for example you might start with the personal pain point um, now uh, for example a lot of these startups the logos you can see starting from a hotmail to a GoPro to Uber or Zappos the founders had a personal pain point so so when 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 hotmail guys they were trying to exchange the mails and they said hey there's there has to be a better way of exchanging mails that's how the first web mail was born red bus is, uh, is from India where two guys one of the guys who wanted to go to his family on vacation said uh, he did not get the buses for for the uh, where the tickets for the evening buses and he said hey there has to be the system is broken there has to be a better way of doing the ticket booking there and he ended up uh, creating a company red bus uh, which actually sells the tickets uh, it became a pan india network at some point in time uh, airbnb was the same thing with with two, a couple of guys who wanted to basically earn some extra income uh, during the uh, South by Southwest and they said hey we are going to put up some air beds there for $80 a night and three people showed up and that's how the whole building uh, the, the whole thing started there so a lot of times people have actually started with a personal pain point uh, but of course it has to be some way of doing it you cannot just start with like you cannot it cannot be a flash in the uh, in your like in the middle of the night you get a dream and say okay I think the world needs a better XYZ and that cannot be the starting point for it it invariably is a personal pain point in some cases it is also solving others problems there so if you if, if, if remember the post-it story when, when Spencer Silver discovered the chemical that won't stick the glue that won't stick and when Art Fry was able to uh, connect it because he used to go to the church and his priest uh, would basically read out from the Bible and he would keep the paper tags there and he said hey maybe I can solve this problem because I can use the glue that Spencer Silver has created and that's how the post-it uh, notepads were born uh, or if you look at Oxo Good Grips uh, the founder's wife had a mild arthritis so he said his wife could not use it and she would complain all the time and say I cannot use a lot of your uh, uh, things that you guys design and he said hey how can I really design it for people who have difficulty in holding something and that's how the Oxford Good Grips was born so sometimes it could be solving others problem that that might be there uh, well there could be so these could be the inspirational kind of starting point 
trend, but there could be other ways. For example, you might uh, uh, use the search trends on Google, for example, or any other uh, service like that. Uh, so let's say I want to look at what is the test automation uh, demand for uh, for this, uh, and I probably want to compare it with an agile coach and a scrum master and a test engineer. I can just go there and within within literally 15 seconds, I, I know if I'm searching it in India in last 30 days, what kind of interest is there. So it's telling me whether the market even is interested in that because today if the interest is there, people will go on the web and they will invariably put in the string and search for that. So that's a good way to kind of get a uh, starting point of that. Uh, we are not looking at it. I mean, remember this is only the first step here of trying to understand is there a problem worth solving. So you could have search campaigns for that. You could actually design such campaigns and you can um, uh, pay some, it's like pretty frugal in terms of $20, $30 and you can do an experiment and see whether any of those uh, keywords land you to uh, one of your landing pages. We'll talk about the landing pages here. As well. and this is one of the examples of landing pages so you don't really have the final product here and as uh, Joel had uh, the guy who built buffer uh, he said hey I want I, I believe that there is an opportunity to build the market for a service where my social media can be scheduled uh, and he didn't know whether people would like it or not so he just built the, the first page and then uh, there was a second page as well so it was a two-page MVP and then when people would click on uh, pay, paying uh, uh, paying and plans, uh, he actually came back and said, hey, gee, you caught us before we are even ready. And that's okay. People find it very funny and they, they don't really mind it. So that, but that allows him to capture the metrics of conversion, how many people are coming to the website, uh, how much time are they spending, are they clicking on it, how is the conversion rate, and that is a good enough starting point to know whether there is even a problem worth solving here. So. Uh, you could also be using things like audience building as a mechanism. So, uh, for example, Ryan Hoover, uh, he started the product hunt in 20 minutes. That was just a quick newsletter. And after two, two weeks, it had 130 subscribers. Today, it has valued more than $20 million. Or Simply Learn is a great company that started out in India here. Uh, it started as a blog, actually. Uh, and then they started putting stuff for PMP. Uh, I think it's been funded now by Sequoia. They've got more than about $28 million funding by now. So it basically is a way to build the audience uh, by content marketing, but that actually allows you to understand whether the whether there are a few hundred people around the world who are looking for exactly the same conversations, and that's a great way to kind of validate is there a problem worth solving or not. Uh, blogs could be another very interesting way of doing it. In fact, the, the picture that you see here in the blog uh, is actually for the same same webinar that we are having right now. What I did was I posted about this webinar on LinkedIn on my social media and then I waited for one or two days and, and, and I saw that hey, there have been for example about 1100 uh, views on that, there have been some likes, uh, the people are coming from these companies and these geographies and these are the typical roles and what have you. So it's a good way to understand what might be a potential interest market or who are the people who basically might be interested. It's a good early way to kind of get a visibility into that. I could be using the same thing with the slide deck. So for example, as a, as a speaker, I do a lot of talks. I do about 20, 30 talks every year. And this is my slide share account here. Uh, I can actually see that one of my talks, which was on storytelling, has got about 20,000 views here, for example, on my slide deck. And I can go and see here on the on the detailed analytics and understand who are the people who have an interest in that, where are they coming from, uh, what kind of uh, jobs do they do, or, or which geographies they are coming from. And that might be a point for me to understand, okay, these markets seem to have this kind of a problem. Maybe the next step for me to, will be to actually go and look into these markets deeply. Uh, I could also use videos as a way to kind of uh, build an MVP and test it, uh, as is the very famous case of Dropbox. Uh, because when Dropbox was created, Drew Houston had a problem because people were so used to uh, doing file transfers, they never thought it's going to be so easy as drag and drop a widget and, and you are done there. So what he did was he actually put up a, a three-minute video on YouTube and, and uploaded uh, the content, I mean, the, uh, gave an update on Dig. Uh, and people saw it and before that there were like 5,000 people with the waiting list and literally overnight it went up to 70,000 people because people could relate to that as a video. They, 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 they saw that as a pain point and they were able to do that. So sometimes a video might be, the actual product doesn't even exist, but then a video is actually able to give a great uh, uh, proxy for, uh, for understanding whether people have that pain point or not. Uh, it could be ad campaigns, you could be doing it on, uh, uh, for example, Facebook, where you are saying, okay, this is the target uh, segment that I'm looking at, and then how has been the reach in terms of my updates uh, on, on my social media and so on. So a lot of these tools are available to slice and dice that, right? So that's basically, uh, well, is there a problem worth solving there? 
Now we go come to the next point here, which is what is the pain point? Just because there is a problem worth solving doesn't mean there could be n number of pain points here, uh, and I may not, I may or may not want to solve uh, one over other, uh, or I might be wasting my time uh, chasing the wrong one. So what is the pain point that I really want? Again, there could be n number of ways of starting out. Uh, inevitably, in today's world, for example, if you are in a B2C or even a B2B kind of a thing, the user reviews are a great starting point. Uh, and typically, every product has some kind of a user forum or user reviews there. Uh, people are ranting there all the time. People are pouring out stories of bad customer service or poor product or poor craftsmanship and so on and so forth there. Uh, and that might give you a perspective of, hey, uh, I think this is an existing pain point. People have this problem there. It is an under... Uh, met underserved market there. If I if I have to do something there, can I start doing something? Because that's very likely that people will start uh, liking it because well, the existing the incumbents are not serving that. Uh, you could go on to do surveys to basically validate and say, hey, what is the pain point here? And surveys might be a great quick way to basically reach out to hundreds of people and really understand. And you, you could probably slice and dice it based on a closed survey or an open survey and so on and so forth. So a lot of tools are available there. If you ask me personally, surveys is, is great, but then I think it limits you into, uh, especially the respondents are ans answering only around what you have asked for. I like the customer interviews. In my view, I think customer interviews are probably the best way in the initial stages to really understand what people's pain point are. Like Steve Blank says that there are no facts inside the building, so get out of the building and talk to the real human being. So I think that's that's an important part. Uh, and these are really exploratory. They're not really meant to be uh, kind of validation, but we are really trying to explore uh, some of these things and understand it. Uh, and the last point here is important. Don't try to be a salesman. A lot of times, uh, the, as a founder, as a techie, I have a, uh, I have a perspective that, hey, I, I let me try and sell, hey, I have a solution in mind, do, what, what do you think of it? We are seeking a validation on that. The key thing is to be an ethnographer. The key thing is to really try and learn and elicit as much as we can from the respondents uh, and, and really be a learner, be a seeker rather than be a salesman there. Uh, so that's, I think, one of the big, uh, things there. Uh, there's another very interesting thing from Liu Common, which is the innovation games some of you might be familiar with. I find it as a, as a great uh, uh, activity uh, which you do along with your customers and you can learn about the pain points. So in this particular thing, the innovation game, I'm using the, uh, the sales port uh, uh, innovation game, where a sales port is really a, a visual metaphor. Uh, but what we are really trying to understand is, hey, what are the anchors that are really slowing down my speedboat? Now, as a speedboat, I want to go faster and faster, but um, uh, there, there might be some headwinds here, uh, and then there could be certain anchors here. The anchors are something that are a part of my own uh, offering, uh, the headwinds might be more external kind of a thing there. So when you are doing this kind of a mapping of headwinds and anchors in a visual manner, first of all, everyone gets it, number one. And number two, when you do it with a customer, you are actually understand, you, your ability to understand the pain point goes up because you are not assuming something, uh, you, you are actually talking to the customer. So I think innovation games is a great way to uh, kind of learn about, about it. The next thing is the customer jobs. Uh, Alexander Osterwalder wrote uh, this fabulous book on uh, the, the um, uh, basically the value proposition design. Uh, and he, he talks about the value proposition canvas, which is a great way to actually uh, look at what the customers are and what are their jobs and the pain points and, the, and what they stand to gain if there were a solution for that. Uh, so uh, it, there's a whole book devoted to that. I would recommend those who are interested to actually spend uh, time on, on going through the book. But it's a great uh, uh, template. It's, it's a great framework in which people can learn about how to uh, understand better about the pain points that the customers have there. Now, after we have understood the pain point, the key thing is, well, who has the pain point? Uh, we have 7 billion people on this globe, and, and, and obviously all the 7 billion cannot be your customers. Uh, even, even, even Facebook doesn't have 7 billion customers. So how do you want to start with that? Uh, uh, like, for example, even Facebook, which has 2 billion uh, users today, started out really as a university uh, kind of a network, first in Harvard and Yale, and, and, and then went on to other universities there. So uh, who has that pain point? Who is my target customer? That's an important part of segmenting uh, there. How can we learn about them? Well, one of the starting ways could be really go with the whole empathy mapping process. So what it essentially means is that I'm talking to the people who potentially might be my end uh, users, and I'm trying to uh, learn about uh, what are their motivations, what are the things that really concern them, what is going on in their mind, what kind of challenge do they face, uh, do they face day in and day out, uh, and so on and so forth. 
uh, and, and, and the biggest challenge that we as product developers and designers face is a lot of times we start um, uh, taking our opinions and we start imposing it on the target group. So we say, hey, I won't want that kind of a feature. Well, the reality is uh, you won't want that feature, but you are not the target user for that. Somebody else is the target user. In this case, Jack is the target user for that. So why are you not listening to Jack and, and, and imposing your own perspective on that? So it's very important to actually uh, uh, de-link the two things. I might have my own perspective as a human being, as a potential user, but if I'm not the target segment for that, I should not really be uh, changing the, the uh, the kind of perspective that are needed here. So empathy map is a great way to kind of get started in a very lightweight manner and build some kind of a customer profile around it. Um, and, and some of the uh, organizations will actually go on to the next stage, which is the more rich uh, user personas. Uh, who are the people who are really, we are looking at, what is the target segment, what are their motivations, what are their engagement levels, what kind of technology products do they like to use it. And uh, uh, if those who are interested should probably check out uh, uh, cooper.com because Alan Cooper who came up with the concept of personas has given a beautiful history behind it. Uh, how did the whole concept of personas originate? Uh, and, and the whole thing was that as developers we have a tendency to kind of bring our perspective and personas really allow us to kind of maintain that neutral perspective here. Uh, then we come to the fourth point here is how are they dealing today? Obviously they are solving their pain points today because they are not exiting the scene. They are not kind of saying that no, we have stopped. Uh, I have a problem in booking taxi. It doesn't mean that I have stopped traveling completely. Maybe I have found a workaround there. So how are they dealing with that today? Because that would be a good insight into what might potentially be leading to uh, its there. Uh, a customer journey map is a great way to kind of look at it and saying, hey, how are you guys doing it today? So again, we are trying to learn it from them where we are saying they are already doing it. So mapping the customer journey can actually help us understand what are some of the biggest pain points? What are some of the friction? And that allows us some, some deep insights into uh, how could potentially we be solving them in, uh, in the next step here. Uh, in, in the startup world, we talk about a concierge MVP, and concierge MVP is pretty much like a concierge white glove service that we can expect probably in a hotel, for example. Uh, so so the, what really happens is that the human beings are substituting for the systems, and they are visible. So so you're not really having, so let's say you want to build, uh, take these examples, food on the table was a service which uh, uh, two founders, they wanted to build it for the housewives. It's like, hey, what kind of a dinner would you like to to cook uh, uh, and then what kind of ingredients would you like to have there now they were not expert in that so they said okay we are going to actually kind of uh, tail you for the next one week in the supermarkets and we want to really learn from you uh, and we want you to pay the ten dollars that we are going to charge you eventually they, they were able to find some uh, one woman who who willingly agreed to be uh, a, a kind of a expert on that and they were basically taking notes of that and they were so they were not like the system which is doing it for them, but they were like the human beings that were visible and like a concierge, they did that. And when you want to learn deeply about it, it's a great way of doing it. There's another example, rent on the runway, which the business model was that there are college women who would like to uh, uh, have a business case for renting out dresses um, uh, and, and if there is a service that's available there. Now again, it's a very complex business case. We don't know how it will happen. There's a lot of hand-holding happening in that process there, but a concierge MVP could be a great way to learn about it. Very closely related to that is what we also call as, as the Wizard of OZ MVP, where the human beings are still doing the work, but then uh, the customers get a feeling that it is a system that is really developing it. And the whole idea is again to develop better understanding about it. And this is this great story about Zappos, where uh, Nick uh, Swinburne, who was the founder of that, he could not buy shoes online. So he said, let me build something. Instead of building the entire thing, he said, uh, hey, what do I need to sell the shoes? I need a visual catalog. I need a way to uh, do the payment on the on the website, and I need a way for the last mile of transaction. So he basically did the same thing manually, and, and then every time everybody would somebody would basically or give an order, he would go to rush to the uh, local shoe store, buy the shoe, and then hand ship the whole thing to them. Uh, but that allowed him to build a business that eventually uh, Amazon acquired for a billion dollars and today it does about $2 billion of revenue. So it, it all has a humble origin, but then being able to test that hypothesis of how people are solving their pain points could be a good starting point there. Uh, I go on to the, uh, the second last point here, which is the number five, like what would delight them? Now, now that we have understood 
what are their pain points, what are they doing today, it might be a good idea to start asking them, hey, what do you think would be a good solution for some of your pain points? And instead of guessing and imposing our point of view, it might be great for us to actually ask them and say, hey, what do you think would be the right solution for that? So uh, this is where we really start getting into a more freewheeling kind of a discussion. Uh, I might be building paper prototypes. I might be building, I mean, so for the simplest thing might be to just take a chart sheet and put post-its and say, hey, is that, is that the kind of a thing you would like to do? Instead of say, asking them, what do you want? We, we probably say, what do you think uh, about this? And they give the feedback there and we are able to kind of move around the post-it notes and, and, and kind of rearrange them there. And this could actually develop into storyboards. It could develop into physical prototypes. It could even be done into something very interesting which is the body storming where we use the human body as a prop basically to so for example if you are actually dealing with uh, let's say airline check-in system and you want to simulate uh, like how how people really would like to have an awesome experience at the time of the check-in test there now this is not something which can be very well described on a piece of paper or writing the specs in a in a word document but there's something that can be very well experienced if you actually use your human body and actually play out as a theater there uh, and it's a fun way of doing it but then people really learn a lot uh, those who are interested should actually check out some of that stuff on Vimeo. Uh, there's an interesting one which is on the beta cup which they actually designed a coffee mug uh, which is a reusable coffee mug. It's it's a great uh, body storming video that's available there. So that could be a very low fidelity prototype there. And then we move, and these are some of the famous ones that we know like for example internet, the ARPA network was just doodled basically or Southwest Airlines it's a great example of three people sitting in a bar and doodling hey how what kind of an airlines we want to start there and kind of write it doodling it on a on a cocktail napkin there or even the Twitter had the same kind of thing where they basically built a like the actual drawing which I have put it in the picture here like hey this is what kind of a service we would like to do so you're kind of visioning the whole thing there and you're trying to get the feedback rather than uh, or in, in a textual form but you're actually using the power of visual uh, telling to basically get the data points we can move on to the high fidelity ones as we get more clarity and confirmation on that and go on to build mockups and, and, and kind of uh, wireframes and mockups and, and so on. There's a lot of software available nowadays to basically uh, build some, something uh, like, like that here. Uh, there's another very interesting concept that um, uh, I call as the Potemkin village. And Potemkin is this whole story of the Russian general uh, who was one of the generals with Catherine the Empress and also one of her lovers. And uh, uh, she uh, basically wanted to inspect some of the villages and what Potemkin did was he said, hey, these villages are not developed and they are not going to be ready so why don't we take a cruise, a river cruise there. And uh, what he would do is he would get his soldiers in the night to come and install these uh, fake kind of villages there uh, and even his soldiers would be dressed up as villagers and farmers and so on and in the morning when the queens and her entourage will pass there they will see that hey all that is developed there and then they would go on to the next one and in the night these guys would ship the whole thing ahead of the cruise and show up the whole thing now it, it might sound like something like fake it till you make it kind of a thing there but I think it has a lot of power of really using it as long as we are not using it for deceit uh, it can definitely serve the purpose of getting some early validation without investing time, effort and money. There is a great uh, video of someone who actually spent only $40 in building a fake uh, kind of stuff there uh, and he was able to save $2 million. So that is actually Paul Hovey, his uh, uh, video is there, I have given the links here, so you, you might want to check it out. Fake doors is another very interesting way of testing it where you are basically saying that hey I know the outcome but I am not sure how people would like to have it. So if people want to buy a book for example maybe they want to search for it or they want to have a recommendation engine or they want to have a catalog there. There could be three ways of doing it. End result is still the same book but so I want what I do is I metaphorically create three fake doors. There is a red door and a yellow door and a blue door and a orange door and depending on which door people click at. Well, people, what, what people don't know is that it's the same outcome, uh, but the way they are choosing it is giving me a lot of insights into how it's being done there. Uh, this particular uh, picture I have taken from a video grab from Polyvore. Polyvore was a company in the fashion. They eventually sold, uh, they were acquired by Yahoo for $200 million. So obviously they were able to build a successful company. Uh, may not be for fake doors alone, but I think it's a great uh, perspective of how you can test it, uh, what kind of a solution, uh, what would delight the people there.
A-B testing is a great example of uh, really understanding more quantitatively what kind of things would people like it. So this is actually from the Obama campaign and there's a very famous example of how uh, during the Obama 20, 2008 and 2012 campaign they actually used a lot of data analytics and really testing out uh, what will appeal to the people there. So I've just taken a simple example that instead of giving a long uh, sign up page, uh, you give a sequential page there, it actually had a 5% higher engagement and people were willing to sign up for that. So small example, but I think there's some very powerful things. Obama was able to get $60 million additional funding from, uh, from the people in 2008 campaign and a lot of that actually goes on to uh, because of the work done by AB testing there. So uh, some great examples are uh, there. there. I talked about the value proposition canvas earlier where we tried to learn about the customers. Uh, at this point in time, we have, because we have done so much of sketching and prototyping and solutioning and so on, we are able to understand what kind of products and services might be available. And what we do in the value proposition canvas is that we try to match it and see whether there is, for every kind of a problem area, have we found something there. So it's kind of a on paper kind of a fit that we are trying to find between the problem areas and the solutions that we can offer. And uh, that is a good starting point because at least we know point for point if, if there is something that's kind of available. And then the, we come to the last question, what would they pay for it? Because uh, for a startup, that's always the problem. I see a lot of times people are saying, okay, I'm going to only build a prototype or an MVP. Why, why should I charge for it? I, I'll give it free of cost. Well, the problem is human behavior follows something that we, know, that we call as the penny gap. And the penny gap is simple that, let's say I'm, I'm selling you something for $5 and I, I increase the price from $5 to $10. You might grumble and you might say, hey, that's not fair, but you might still pay for it if you like that thing. But if I give you something free of cost and now I raise the prices to $2, guess what? A lot of, lot of people disappear. So we are, we are so used to getting it free that when you put a price tag on that, it doesn't really. So, so the feedback is never complete if you don't really take the price tag here. So uh, that's the that's kind of a thing that um, um, there. So how do we test it? Again, going back to the same landing page example, which uh, Joel had done for Buffer, what he did was that he actually inserted some kind of a, uh, a, a price tag here and which allowed people to kind of say, and some people actually clicked on it. Uh, so that's a great example of that. Uh, you could be doing a pre-order pages. So even Apple does it actually. We've done it for iPhone, for example, that my product is not shipping yet, but I do a pre-order -pre kind of a thing. And it allows me to understand and gauge the propensity of my potential buyers to kind of um, uh, look, at, look at one of these uh, products here. Uh, Pebble is a great example of that. Pebble doesn't exist because last year I think they got acquired by Fitbit. But Pebble, when it started, was a great example of building a smartwatch, which was uh, kind of a, like it was almost like all the power packed into a wristwatch. So uh, how do you do that? So they basically went to probably the best incubator of all the ideas available today, which is Kickstarter. And they created a campaign on Kickstarter. And it was probably the most successful campaign on, uh, in the history of Kickstarter because in two hours they were able to collect hundred thousand dollars now they don't have a product they, they have just an idea which they have told a story to the people but the story is so resonating with people that people are willing to put money even before seeing the product there uh, and then within 28 hours they were able to collect a million dollars eventually they got 68,000 people to back over 10 million dollars and Pebble was a great product there as long as it lasted there uh, but it's, it's a great way to kind of look at it there's another interesting thing that people try it in the publishing. So like leanpub.com, if you go, you can buy a book and you can pay what you like. So that's a good way of really understanding what is the net worth of your work uh, that from people's point of view. And people, if, if hundreds of people come and buy it, you will see a price curve there and that could be a good way to start. So maybe you can do it as a campaign for two weeks, do the price curve and then really do the pricing based on that. So these are, these are the things they are that kind of uh, do that right there's a lot of softwares available there which uh, which could do that i'm not going to detail but uh, but these are these are some of the things that can do more things uh, there i'm on the last two slides i know i've kind of run out of time but i just want to uh, complete that so some of the pitfalls of mvp testing uh, confirmation bias is something that i talked about people are seeking validation of what they already believe is true that's not really the point of an mvp testing we are trying to really learn about the MVP uh, and, and the hypothesis. Starting too late is again a problem. You don't want to wait till 100% of your product is ready. You want to really ideally do it in the beginning stages sooner than later is really helpful. Uh, it's not an expedite time to market thing. It's really expedite the feedback, which is more important. 
accelerate revenues is again not the aim of it even if you put a price tag on mvp at best we are trying to understand the propensity of users to pay for a certain solution there so i think this would be an important part here we are not selling the solution but we are really trying to seek the learning so that would be again another uh, pitfall here uh, another thing about the mvp is that we invariably fail and people think of failing is really a failure i think fail fast is not a failure fail fast is a success as long as we are able to accrue the right ROI on that by investing minimum effort to kind of get maximum outcome on that. And ignoring the feedback obviously would uh, be like why do you want to even take the feedback if you don't intend to do that. So uh, so I think let's let me just uh, wrap it up the whole thing with the last uh, few, few points on that. Uh, the startups exist to search for a business uh, model. They don't quite know what is going to make money and they are really looking for it. Building 100% of the product base simply on the assumptions is fatal and they probably, it's not probably the best idea to do that because you don't want to discover that you were chasing the wrong problem after 12 months and after like writing off a million dollars there. MVP is a, as a process is, is a great way to allow systematic validation of the riskiest hypothesis. So it allows you to kind of build it and depending on which level, which kind, which stage of the problem solving you are in, there are n number of tools available, n number of MVPs are available for us to validate the riskiest hypothesis. Uh, the key thing is to test the MVPs to allow a validated learning to drive further decisions. We, it should not be really based on intuition or a gut feel there. So I think that's, that's really I would like to kind of uh, add here. To, uh, with that, I know I've kind of run out of time, Smitha. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm your culprit here. Uh, but uh, I hope I was able to cover a lot of it. Uh, I, I don't know if we still have time for Q&A or not, but I'll let probably, I'll hand it over back to Smitha for uh, for helping me out of this situation. Thank you, Smitha. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Tathagat. You don't need to change the presenter. It's it's fine. We can just go ahead. And um, I really like how you have uh, so many examples and stories for everything, uh, every point that you explained. So that, that was really interesting. Uh, Thank you. We do have a couple of questions. Maybe I just ask you, uh, one or two and we post the rest of them uh, offline and we, then we can sure. post the responses. Yeah. So quickly, yeah. Uh, one is, as a tester, how can I help my business uh, identify the best landing page? And uh, maybe we just take a 30 seconds response to this. Yeah, so I think the key thing is really that, um, uh, and and uh, I, I, I'm glad you asked because I actually uh, skipped uh, one of the slide here in the interest of time. I will just keep it on uh, and later on people can check it out. Uh, a lot of times I think the test engineer's ability to really build a invalidating MVP rather than a validating MVP I think would be a key to that. But a lot of times we are seeking success, the success this can come to a very small hand-picked uh, number, but invalidation of the MVP would be actually, so actually having a hypothesis uh, which gets uh, negated is more important here rather than a hypothesis that gets validated because there could be n number of conditions in which the validation can happen, but invalidation when it happens will actually give you uh, uh, unequivocal uh, uh, feedback that, hey, this is not the right hypothesis here. I think that could be a way to go. So uh, I'll, I'll give the link to that, but short answer would be, to a tester's finesse in really being able to design the right hypothesis would be extremely important here. And thank you, Tathagat. Uh, one quick thing, the, there's a question around empathy map. So just wanted a confirmation. It says that it looks like a mind map. Can we use it as a, can we use mind map as a tool to develop the empathy map? I'm tempted to say yes, but uh, want a quick confirmation from you. Uh, a short answer is these are, they might have, but empathy map is really all about a person, a mind map obviously can be a very and maybe maybe if you make a mind map for one person, it might resemble that, but that might only be an incidental uh, uh, resemblance. Thank you for uh, your time today, and it was a very insightful session with uh, quite a few practical tips and information on founding components for building a successful startup. So I'm sure our attendees found it very informative and useful too. So thanks again, and I hope to see you again. Thank you, so Sita. Thank everyone. you, Peggy. Uh, thanks for all that. Yeah, I'm sorry. I was just saying, I'll, I'll complete, I'll upload the deck there and I'll share the link. Uh, if you are following the Software Test Pro uh, 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 Twitter handle, then you will uh, probably in the next half an hour get that. And uh, yeah, do, do connect up. Uh, if you have any questions, we'll be happy to answer it. And I look forward to hearing more from Smita on the questions that we have on the session today. Uh, and I look forward to sharing the answers with you all. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Tathagat. Well, everyone, this concludes our webinar for today. Thanks, everyone, for joining. And uh, more importantly, thanks for uh, asking questions and making it engaging. Stay tuned for more webinars and the online trainings coming soon. And if you haven't signed up yet for the upcoming webinar, Getting Started with Automation by Curtis, which is scheduled to be on 14th June, the link is up for you uh, to review and to register. Please go ahead and do it at softwaretestpro.com. Thanks, everyone. Have a great weekend. See you all in Washington. Thank you.